Okay, um, so I'm going to be looking at a couple pieces today, a little bit of everything. I'm going to try to cover everything in uh, on the docket today. <clears throat> so we've got this piece, this eye study, I think it's by um, a regular here in our stream. Um, but the first and most important thing is I got a darken layer and um, and what I did was I grabbed just one of the highlighted, let's just one lighter shadows and use that to get rid of the white. That's a big problem is the white. I think you're copying from a photorealism painting, but it's just photorealism, it, it gets it gets away with these tiny little brush strokes. So it's photorealism, it's pixel to pixel copying of the reference. <clears throat> so you can use a photorealistic painting, I guess, if it's good as a reference. If not, just get yourself a photograph. Um, a couple of issues. So right here uh, we have, well, let me just get a better brush. We've got this pupil and the upper half of that pupil is like, well, that's a messed up circle, um, you know, hidden by the eyelid and we've got half the, I mean the iris and then the pupil we've got almost completely hidden. So what you did was you showed the entire iris and then the pupil is up here. So it doesn't work like that for humans. It's a perfectly centered uh, system for it, for the lights and the image to be distributed evenly. If it was off to one side, I think that we, we, we wouldn't see things as symmetrically as we do or as accurately as we do distance-wise and depth-wise. Um, so you need to push this down a little bit. I'm going to try to do that right now for you. <coughs> oh my god. Um, don't surrender to your evil back. No, I won't surrender. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm just correcting this. It needs to be a little bit lower and in the center. So right now it's too late for me to kind of edit it the way this eye looks exactly. Whoa, so I don't know what reference they used. Photorealist artists like to hide their references and pretend that they they memorize the eye to look like this, which is not possible. Some people, maybe if they've drawn the same eye a hundred times, and they can actually learn to memorize it. But photorealism is a very specific kind of art. It's very photodependent. It's not so much, you know, synthesis and making something out of nothing or, or, or combining two units. It's mostly just exact, like you're a printer. <coughs> I think it's the, uh, it's the equivalent of being a like a printer, but a human version of a printer. So what we're doing <laughs> is I'm just trying to figure out how to get it to look a little bit more like this. When the eye is open this much, this is a very uh, specific kind of expression. It's very shocked, and that's because you showed too much of the the larger circle. You need to hide some of that in this kind of line right over here. But other than that, I think you have some great detailing. You get away with the details in here, and you don't get away with it around the eyebrows. So what I recommend you do is blend or smudge away some of this. And the, pretty much for eyebrows, it's detail, relief, detail, relief. So you've got detail, and then relief, and then detail, and then relief, and then detail, and then relief. You just keep going back and forth between this pattern. You don't want to overfeed the, with the detail it's going to look very uncanny and very unusual. The reason why is because when we look at something, we, we look at one thing at a time. Write that back to me. That's a very significant thing to remember. We look at one thing at a time. We don't look at everything at the same time the way a camera does. A camera captures everything at the same time, all the pixels, all the details, unless otherwise instructed to do so. So if it's um, like a, a blur or something like that or a, or a focus, and even cameras have to focus on something. But we humans, with our eyeballs, look at one thing at a time. And when we provide too much detail, we're basically saying we're seeing all these things at the same time, which is not possible. We don't have multiple pupils and one brain. So we wouldn't be able to see more than one focal point. There's always one focal point, which is the point of focus. That's basically what it means. So you just don't detail eyebrows like this. You just go about it a little bit more carefully, making sure that the detail cluster, the amount of small brushes that you've used, do not contest with the uh, with the eyeball. The eyeball is the main detail point at this stage. 
His eye is hooded. He's got some fat because he's squinting a little. Kind of looks like a male eyebrow, male eye because of the low eyebrow arc kind of gives it off as male. So what I'm doing here is I'm just trying to make it read as if he also has a bit of a hooded eye, but even then the eye is wide open, so the hood kind of disappears. Oh my god, I'm in so much <laughs> Oh my god. You gotta laugh, because laughter is like a kind of painkiller. So I gotta go and just turn on some Dave Chappelle and just watch some, some Chappelle. I'm broke! <laughs> I can't say the rest of that quote, but you know where that's going. Sprinkle some crack on him. Go watch that. Watch that one. <clears throat> what the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> so right here, you see how it made this plane, and now it's overlapped the circular um, arc. Right here, we have a halfway point shadow, just like that, because as you can see, it kind of descends into a shadow. So these are the changes I would make. Right now your eyebrow is also very, very small. Where his eyebrow is just a little bit bigger. So the eyebrow was small. The whole eye was just a little bit off. <clears throat> it's the rack. Let's stay on topic. Don't make me bad. <laughs> I will go give her a massage. It's not muscular. It's, it's skeletal. So it's a massage isn't going to do shit. Massage ain't gonna do shit. What the fuck am I saying? Stop, Mr. Rack. Focus. This is not a casual hang. This is a class. So just focus. I wish sometimes I can just go home and call in a substitute teacher and they can roll in the TV. And uh, I could just put a movie on instead of teach today. No, I love teaching. So I don't want to cancel this class because I love these meets. They're really fun for me. So I'll show you the before and after. I'm doing some more of that detail relief. And if in that blurring detail relief thing that you did, um, you're getting a kind of a blurry technique, you can go over it. You can bring in detail, paint it in, but you have to use a large brush. And what I do with eyebrows is I drag in the outer color and just bring it back. Well, the massages still feel nice, no? Yeah. But it's not going to work. Abu, I hear myself. Please turn it down. <laughs> Abu has me on speakers in the other room. <laughs> so weird. So weird. At no point in history could you say you were just hearing yourself. You know, it's only recently. You just hear your own voice spoken back to you. It's some fucking Twilight Zone kind of shit. I hate editing videos because I hate hearing my voice. It's just weird. Everyone's just so weird about their own voice, you know. This entire area is under a hood. So this version, this is very two different eyes. This one seems a little bit stronger and more fatty now that we're working on it. So we're gonna have stronger shadows moving down. You can see this entire plane. If you just got an entire brush to represent it, this entire plane looks away from the light source. So we need to see that kind of representation for the lower eyelid and its crease. I don't know what brush you used here, but stop using it. You don't need those little speckles. And this isn't the illusion of texture. This is an actual texture. Okay, don't use those little speckle brushes to bring in some kind of surface texture or pores or something like that. You're simply not, it's simply not going to work. Just use a brush that has exterior texture to it, like this brush for instance. Just take a look, I'm going to do a quick stamp. See these, these, these pieces of texture I've added here on the outside. This is all you need, just tiny little bristles. Very, very similar to what we get when we're painting with a dry brush. And that's all you need. You just need those little extra bit, bits of detail on the outside if you want that painterly textured look while you're while you're drawing, while you're painting. Oh my god. Ugh. Holy god. And I hate my doctors because they're so unreasonable. We have to do extensive imaging before we can provide you with any kind of pain killing options. It's like, what's your point? I mean, I don't get it. Like, okay, so like now until I have my results, I'm now I'm gonna be in pain. Is that it? Is that what you're saying? Yes. So how are you a doctor? Aren't you supposed to stop the pain? Like, how are you even a doctor? Like, what the F, man? Alright, so if we squint our eyes, everybody squint your eyes, and you can see like a shadow just around this area, and then you can see the light. For you, you inverted that. 
you made the eye, the waterline, a shadow, and the eyelid area, the light, which is a complete inversion of what's supposed to happen. Isarak, how do you use a large brush but maintain detail? Um, making sure that you're working with a high opacity level. It, the detail comes out of the edge work, which is a really big thing to say. It's a whole, it needs a whole fundamentals lesson behind it to say that edges bring in detail. A lot of people know what that means that in the audience, a lot of people don't. Uh, but essentially what it means is that when you have a sharp disconnection, a sharp edge between two shades, you get detail. That's one way to detail it. It doesn't always mean we're shrinking our brush. So when we enlarge our brush and still bring in detail, it means that we are using edges. We're not painting away the edges that that large, sharp, squared brush is bringing in. We're not painting them away. We're keeping them intact. All right, so I'm just going to get dark and layer. I'm going to try not to die. And I'm just going to cast a shadow off the upper eye. Eyelid, sorry. I've been slurring my words all day in my private sessions as well. Okay, and then one more little topic I want to cover is the eyelashes. So let's see, I'm radially just representing that little cusp, I guess. I'm not sure what to say, what to call it, but this little, this little blurb, <laughs> this little uh, blob, I guess. I don't know what, it's the hooded eye fat kind of just drapes over the rest of the eye and then connects into the temple. I should not be teaching. I'm losing all credibility just, <laughs> just trying to put these sentences together. This is some inhumane, this is cruel and unusual punishment. I don't know. It's okay, it's humbling. <clears throat> so, uh, what was I saying? Fuck. Um, oh my god, I can't even post this video. I'm so sorry, people on YouTube. Please forgive me for <laughs> really bad performance today. I'm going to try to... Oh, fuck, what was I saying? Lashes, right. So, um... So lashes do a little thing like this. They do a, a little fanning where you did this. I want to know why you did this when they should have been doing, when they should have been doing this. See how they're doing that shape. You did this because in your mind everything is flat. Everything is ironed out. In your mind, let's say you had a table in your mind. In your mind, <sighs> that's hard. You have a bunch of pictures. Okay that you're just sorting out and you call on them when you need help and this is this is the it's got a little lamp and some light independent lamp whatever and this is where this is where you go I think it was Lisa who painted this this is where you go to sort through some papers when you need something when you need to draw something this is where you go to sort it this is also where you go to sort it when you're trying to interpret this this image goes into your brain okay goes into your brain gets muddled and flippered around. I don't know what those words are. Um, and they just move right back through your hand and onto your paper. Okay? This little flubberation right here that happens in your brain is a result of, or is one of the, is caused by this, which is one of the reasons why this happens. This little, oh, see? This little, this little setup right here, you've got a bunch of flat images. A professional artist, the reason why this flubberation doesn't happen is because this, the professional artist doesn't have images. They've got sculptures. So they've got real sculptures of things. They've got all kinds of like cubes and squares. And this is what doing form studies does. Instead of having flat images on your table of referencing in your brain, you get forms. Okay, and you've got an infinite amount, and you don't have to look at them through one flat image. You can walk around the table and see these from different angles. So when this image enters your brain and goes back onto your paper, it has access to all of this wonderful resource. That's what doing form studies does for you. So the reason why, despite you had the reference right there, the reason why your lashes turned into that is because you had an ironed out version whereas this person he's got lashes he's got something that helps him understand lashes probably some kind of sculpture that shows how lashes look in different angles 
All right, so that's how you got to start thinking. Is my visual library the reason why, despite me having the reference right there, for some reason I was blind to it? Or I couldn't interpret it, so I went to the nearest available image that showed me how to interpret eyes. And right here in this reference, you went to it, and you saw the last successful painting that you drew of an eye, and your lashes were all pointing this way. So when you got, de when you got to these lashes, you started just doing the exact same thing. You didn't know how to interpret it on a three-dimensional way, even though, even though the reference was right there. All right? So remember that you are always a victim of your brain. Your brain is always out to sabotage whatever you're out to do. So the lashes, I know it's just lashes. Wow, she made a whole lecture out of lashes, but the lashes, is, it's a small little artifact of what's really happening in your brain right now. It's a small little example. It's a, it's a little... Um, what do you call those things that you a specimen of your issues and this is a small little fragment a little instance of this greater massive issue that you're having with your interpretation of stuff so each me as a teacher I start to look at this as a scientist and break it down um, not only do I have to look out for these issues but what what they're cluing me in on the student and this is telling me that there are some real fundamental issues you're having with your interpretation of the z-axis is there a z-axis in your brain at this time that helps you interpret the z-axis when you see it? Okay, these reach out, these fan out, lashes fan out on a three-dimensional level along the z-axis to catch the light and shade and work like whiskers. If anything tries to come close to your eyes, your lashes feel it first and they close instantly and therefore protecting your delicate little instrument that does everything for you. Okay, this instrument is all that we are if we don't have eyes we just can't, we can't be artists we can't I mean, yeah you can but you know what i'm saying this tiny little instrument is all about the lashes and so when we're painting something we paint its functions to provide the realism realism is function so if you're painting the wrong kind of eyelash you're not painting a realistic eye, eye anymore you're losing points this rack it's just lashes no it's not it's function it's a collective function. One, it reveals that you're having issues with form and z-dimension, um, the z-axis, the third dimension, and two, it's just mean, it means that you don't have an awareness of the anatomy, how important it is to actually show how these lashes fan out. I'm trying to make it a little less shocked. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, an ins a severe uh, instance here of, of, of a lack of form. And um, you either have a square or you have a cube in your mind. And that's what I mean when I say you're either thinking in two dimensions or three, that whole table layout. That's just one interpretation of how we, I guess, store information. Obviously, we don't have a table in there. Okay, so keep that in mind, boys and girls. Anyway, before, after. So it made the eye make a little bit more sense. I did move away from the reference but only because it wasn't working the way it was in the reference in your image. So I kind of just moved the eyebrows up. The eye is much larger in your version. The pupil and the, and the iris are much larger. Istabrak, is it possible to start with brushes like hair brushes and so on? Hair brushes are dangerous, graphic. Um, they're very, very dangerous. But a hair brush is basically, this is a weird brush I found a long time ago. And the reason why I would never use this for hair is just because it's giving you too much detail too soon. It doesn't give you enough of a, of a kind of like a coverage on the, on the real bulk of the hair piece. So if you're doing this anywhere else, especially for lashes, you're making a mistake. Ha hair doesn't just do this. You have to, when you get to the, when you're done with all your bulk stro brush strokes for the hair, I have to do a whole day just for hair. Um, uh, when you're done with all that bulk foundation stuff and you get into the really, really thin brush strokes, you have to calculate exactly where you're placing those thin brush strokes. Whereas here, it's giving you six at a time, seven at a time. And that's, that's too much. That's too much information you're providing. You already did all the hard work with your large brush that when you move into your small brush, you have to make sure it's a one, one brush. It's not a speckle brush or a scatter brush or something like that. Hair brushes, I think what you're referring to, hair brushes, uh, skin, skin pore brushes, anything that speckles for you might be a little bit dangerous. It's giving you too much information, more than you're ready to filter and to mediate as a student. 
the professional, of course, know exactly how much to take from the brush if the brush is giving them too much information. They know how to edit that and bring it down. Uh, but a student doesn't know better yet. You can kick my ass any day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir, I just assumed 170. Hope this helps you, Lisa. Okay. So this piece is using a reference. Let me see if I can get some stuff out of the way before I do this. And some of the issues you're having here can be fixed with a large soft brush. The issue is in traditional work, we don't have a soft brush. So how do we, I always do this. I always ask myself, okay, if, am I depending too much on a digital tool? If I have a soft brush and I know it's doing wonders for my painting digitally, if I was ever stranded in doing a traditional technique, how do I make that soft brush effect? I can't just get a soft brush and, and, and airbrush everything. I'll be painting where I don't have a darkened layer or a lightened layer in, 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 um, in uh, real life. So uh, everyone malice direct narcotics. Oh my god. <laughs> don't say that here. You two will get on my ass. A strike. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, uh, what I mean is try to find, as you're painting traditionally, if this was a traditional, I'm going to explain exactly what it is, what I'm talking about, like mistake-wise, but if this was a traditional piece and you had to edit an entire area to make it soft, you won't be able to do that. You'll have to blend and re-blend and redraw anything that those new, uh, that new pencil or uh, paint or pigment that you're bringing in, you have to keep working as if you're constantly using a soft brush. Always assume that you're going to need to soften everything at the, at the end because skin is like that. It's very translucent. It's got a lot of diffusion and subsurface scattering under the surface and oils and, and stuff like that. Soft brush is great. Of course, this is digital. We can just do it digitally, but this is for those traditional artists who want to find the equivalent of what I'm about to change. Uh, you, got, you don't have a soft brush to save you at the end. You have to do this as you go. So what is it that we're doing as we go? There's squint your eyes. Everybody squint your eyes. We're seeing a very distinct shape right here, getting darker on the deepest portion and the boniest portion of the eye socket. And what we're doing is we're fanning it out. Right, right here, what you do, what you did is you had like sudden breaks in that beautiful fanning out, that natural gradient. You had like really overly defined, overly um, exaggerated outlines around the eyes. And lo and behold, you've got a student who's over outlining the eye. It's always a result of that flat table with those flat images on it. If you just have faith, have faith at the geometry, respecting the geometry before, res before bringing in any kind of outlining detail will work, especially if we don't see the eye. Don't worry that we're not seeing the eye right now. Don't worry. The eye is in shadow. It's got such little contrast. You're not, you're not supposed to see it in the amount of detail you've shown it here. What you have to do is capture that shadow. Most importantly, capture that shadow. Okay, so we're squinting our eyes. We're trying to capture this exact little uh, description of the, the light source. All cast shadows describe the light source. Okay, looking at a cast shadow is like carbon dating um, a fossil. You're finding everything that had to do with it. It's revealing everything. It's not hiding a thing about the nature of the object, or maybe carbon dating isn't that accurate, but for the sake of the metaphor. <clears throat> All right, so cast shadow. Um, what was that? What was that thing that I just said? I completely forgot it. Um, can't feel my legs. <laughs> uh, the cast shadow is. Uh, Reveals everything about a light source. Tells a story. Reveals it all. Okay. So right now that we did that, let me just quickly block over this. Basic blocking brush. Nothing, nothing extreme. All right. We can see that the eye was way too small considering how big his eye was compared to his nose. His eye feels like it weighs much less if we were to weigh them on a scale. Always ask yourself that question. If I were to weigh them, would they be the same? So now we'll get to enlarge the eye. Okay, place it in the right spot. So over defining eyes is a massive little like um, um, indicator that you that you have an issue with your outlines. You have an issue with your dependency. That you have an anxiety when you get to the eyes. You want us to see the face that so you think drawing the eyes and over outlining them will do that for you. When you're an artist you gotta learn to let go of, of, of detail. When you're an artist you have to let go and worship only the light. The light is the only thing that's gonna get you something realistic. 
The light reveals its characteristics through a cast shadow. That's a little bit more eloquent. Write that back to me. Okay, so now we're just taking care of the, we're using a soft brush, really low opacity. We're taking care of this uh, cast shadow issue here. Yo, Chrome has just been crashing like nonstop. Like holy crap, it just completely crashed. Holy crap. <laughs> it just completely crashed, you guys. I don't, it's just, all I have is you guys open. That is so weird. I'm going to have to just quit Skype. I don't know what's happening. Chrome has been crashing like crazy. Um, but yeah. Light reveals its characteristics through cast shadows. Exactly. So now I'm just adjusting some more stuff. You see this beautiful little bit of light that's bounced off off this plane. So that gets touched here. You didn't have much of that. You were too focused, too worried, too too stressed out about the about the eye, making sure the eye, it's all about the eye. I gotta put a line of shadow here under the eyelid. I gotta go near the lashes and put some more shadow over here. I gotta just do it, man. But you had some contrast issues, you had light lights and dark darks, and you just had too many issues that you have to iron out, and that's where you know these were what, what was important. These are what's important. Getting rid of this excessive contrast dependency, which is a sign that you have flat images and symbols and lines in your brain. And you don't have a table full of 3D sculptures. And when we look at these 3D sculptures, we don't have them in detail. They're not detailed Grecian sculptures. They're blocky, low poly, Asaro head style little sculptures we have lying around in our brain, revealing to us real planes, real science. Okay, so everything I'm doing right now is just, just caused by just looking at this. I shrink my reference. When we shrink the reference, when we shrink the, when we zoom out, we shrink the reference as well. The eye is still too small. Very, very small little eye. I think right here is just fine. <coughs> So again, just stop giving the outlines a chance and start giving the head a chance, start giving the form a chance. So when we zoom out, we can see gradients much better, we can see areas that fuzz out much much better, much more clear. And then you have a great blocking here, beautiful job, I really commend you for this block. In fact, I'm not even going to blend it because in the reference he really does have a very angular nose. But just everywhere else, nothing is that extreme. All things are fuzzed out. And I'm just going to get a quick lighten layer and just lighten all of this excessive shadow you're using. You want to capture the nature of a form, you capture it in its values. You don't bring in your own contrast. Never bring in your own contrast. Write that back to me, please. Fuzzing out the eyebrow. Again, we're not bringing in our own contrast. So now I get to go in and detail the eyebrow as I need to. Tiny little speckles here of detail. Normal. Tiny little pieces, all zoomed out. Look at how zoomed out I am, but I'm bringing in detail because I raised opacity all the way up, and I'm preserving the edges of what I'm bringing in. Bringing in some detail here. Of course I'm going to blend away. Everything goes through the filter of smudging, but I'm not going to smudge all the sides of the brush. Some areas stay intact. To zoom in a little bit. I did shrink my brush. Okay, just using this as a reference. Um, exactly. Never bring in your own contrast. Thank you. Good boys and girls. Don't you guys miss that? Just bringing in like a <laughs> substitute teacher on those rainy days. You stay inside the class and you gotta you get to watch like a movie or something on a little rolly television. Those are some good times. Now that we have a good uh, cast shadow moving around, we can start defusing. We've got to defuse one, two, three planes here of defuse. Okay, so we've got a little bit of this cheek bouncing up. What I do is I grab the exact color that's bouncing, the exact value, and I lower its opacity. And that's just how much of a fraction it lost after it bounced. In fact, 
I'm going to try this again because I kind of got rid of the detail. Right before the crease, we get like a little perfect little gesture like that. See this little line right here? This is for the lower eyelid. And this is all what goes into painting from a reference properly. We do it in layers. We cast the first couple shadows in its nature as it, the nature of the light source that it's revealing, the characteristics of the light source. It's a little artifact left behind by the light, revealing the nature of the light. Cast shadows reveal the nature of the light. Okay, I'm just going to quickly get sharpened tool. If you have a nice texture on your brush, the brushes I may do have a great texture on them, so I like to sharpen that texture back out with sharpen tool. Again, this is a luxury of digital. We don't really have an equivalent to this in, uh, in real life, so I am sorry about that for those traditionally bound artists. Okay, so I'll do the before and after. Of course, the changes are massive. As you expect, I've pretty much repainted the entire thing, but I hope in the process of me repainting it, you kind of see where you fell off in your process. You kind of had these instances where you just let go and did your own thing, and then doing your own thing, you started doing your own thing as guided by your in insecurities, the two-dimensional insecurities, or two-dimensionally bound insecurities in your brain, the, the kind of stuff that makes you make bad choices later on when you're working outside of a reference. You get it? You kind of have to stick to the reference right now. You'll do your own thing outside of a study. Think of it like that. You'll get to bring all your creative energy when you're painting your own little illustration with its narrative and it's got a passion behind it and a personal story. But until then, everything is a study. And in my piece of advice, you want the, I guess this is the, like, the best, I wish I, someone gave me this advice. Don't, if you're working to, um, for commissions and you're painting book covers for people and characters, treat it as a study as well. You'll actually get a higher success rate if you treat it as a study. If you try, if you try to make it a passion project, or try to proxy some of the passion of the writer, whoever's hired you, into the uh, into the project itself, you will not succeed. You just won't. You just won't be driven. See what I'm doing right now? I'm outlining the the track of the cast shadow. <laughs> Rex says, never bring audience your own contrast. I see it already. You mean the t-shirt designs? <laughs> oh god, the Bob and Steve one. And then finally, I'm going to make some more borders here. Just a couple more. This guy's got a great nose. Okay, and just over here you have too sharp a shadow around the nostrils. Again, this is a shadowed area. See how you're using a non-local value here? A non-local value means a value that belongs up here, used down here. You just don't lower that baby down. Nothing here is telling you that that bounce light is that extreme. And this is a great plate. So after this, all you got to do is just bring in the contrast. Now you get to bring in the black and white. And you got to bring it in only where it's needed. So where does it, where does it need it? Um, so it's needed just around here. Just around here. I'm going to try to lasso just to get this completed a little faster. Probably need to finish up class. Got to get going. Okay. So zoom out. <clears throat> and just uh, gently bringing in with a soft brush the darkest darks I would use in this area. And you got a pretty diffused painting as is. I mean a reference. It's not that intense. A little bit more over here. Oh my lord. Oh my lord. bit more here, introduced radially, not that extreme an edge. We just keep going. Dark spots around the eyes, nostrils, and mouth. You see that? But none of this would be possible without that soft brush working to generate a more believable indication of the light source's characteristics, which is a very soft, nearby though, it's not a super sharp shadow. It's nearby, it looks like it's universal, like you're outside in the park or something. 
And then just gotta bring in, if you want to, some more um, hair texture. Of course, you gotta be careful. You already laid down the groundwork. You already made larger decisions already. After that is just uh, minor detailing. Okay, so I will do a before and after. It is quite a difference. But really what I want you to, th to look at the most, of course some of these are my own personal taste and how much I'm preserving from the photograph. I do preserve quite a bit from the photograph. I do, a lot, I do I make, break a lot of rules. I've covered that in some of the Patreon videos I've done. Um, I break a lot of rules, but I, uh, I do depend on the photograph quite a bit if I'm looking at form or form and any real presence of the form. I kind of just let the photograph do that, take care of all of that. But, uh, but what I want you to look at the most is the nature of the shadows. So you did what you did with the eyes and that got in the way of you treating it as a building. You didn't treat it as a building as you should have. You treated it as a face that you did your own thing with and that own thing brought in some of the weaknesses that you have. And in doing that, you lost some of the real indication of form, which everything is, is about. Everything is about light. Everything is about the nature of the light and what the light is doing. No, this is not going to work. So I'm just going to bring in, bring it in with Dodge Tool. Some of the white pieces here. Traveling upward. There's some more here along the nose. Maybe five for this. No, one. Seven. I hate lasso right now. Lasso is just not listening to me. If you have a good light environment, you should be able to deselect with lasso the object from the background. That's like the biggest give giveaway. If you have a good distinction between the background values and the and the lights. This is if it's an empty room, of course. If we have objects in there, we just don't have that kind of distinction. Hey! Shush! I don't know what I've selected. Oh, good God, help me. I'm so slow today. I don't know what I'm doing right now. Okay, there we go. <coughs> so yeah, I'm just bringing in this dodge tool right here just to show where that highlight is. And you see you're slowly bringing that contrast back in. You haven't really lost all of it. Not looking at the comment section, but do write your questions now if you have any questions about the changes I made. If the artist is here with us today, um, feel free to ask me some questions. Okay, so again, we captured the nature of the shadow. This is what stays in your brain. This is what makes that, dresses that table up with three dimensions. Everyone knows you know how to draw the, your own personal eye. Yeah, you can draw any eye. The eyes are easy, and outlining the eyes is a very easy thing to do, meaning eyes are easy mistakes. But what's, what your brain does not have in it is a good, wide um, variety of shadows. So you end up using too much contrast, and you have a less realistic image. And then using that much contrast, I brought a line here, I brought a line here, I brought a line here. I brought too much contrast down here. You didn't notice you were draw actually drawing really um, off proportions. Another fundamental issue, anatomy got affected by you not looking at the nature of the shadow. Yeah, the chin does need to be moved forward. The thing is, you get away with that if you don't have a good, um, like, exact measurement because chins do come in overbite, underbite, and all of that business. So if, if you want to copy the reference, you do have to move the chin forward. I think his chin is still just a little softer than the change I made. Okay, so capture the nature of the shadow. If anything is important, it is the nature of the shadows. 
because they reveal the direct nature of the light source. And if you're preserving in your mind and memorizing instances of light sources, you're pretty much going to become a computer. You're going to become an art computer. You have nothing can sneak up on you. Any reference is easy to copy. And if you ever didn't, if you ever wanted to move away from references, you can because you have this pool of knowledge in your mind out of studies that were performed efficiently. You weren't focusing on the eyes. Who gives a damn about the eyes? Who cares about the eyes? Forget about the detail. I've always said who gives a crap about the detail. Nobody does. Artists, anyway, real professionals. The, the detail is non, not consequential. They end up painting these amazing painterly pieces from like like this zoomed out <laughs> and you wonder how they pulled it off. It's because they weren't looking at a face. They saw a building instead. Okay. So yeah, it's low contrast. That's fine. It's still very early. Unfortunately, I can't go in and bring in all the shadows I need. I'm running out of time, but this is definitely a good path to start moving in to change the image. You do have a darker light environment around here, so that might help you if you bring in a shadow on this side of the face. Um, but that's it for this correction today. All right, any questions? How do you practice edge work? Uh, by working outside of contrast, um, looking for uh, uh, like um, any chances that you can have, when, especially when you have shades that are really similar to each other, and the only thing that differentiates them is an edge. Um, you look for those instances. Also, edge work happens naturally as you get better. You just work better with your brush and know where to place paint and where to stop paint. Remember, painting is in knowing where to blend and where not to blend. And as you get better mileage-wise, the stuff I can't reach, the stuff only you can reach, um, you learn how best to choose and how when, to, when it is best to stop blending. Just stop. Just cut it out and have an edge. <clears throat> <laughs> Become an art computer. Print art with hand. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, thank you, Rex. Fill your pool of knowledge with objects, not line art. Exactly. Objects, real objects. You can rotate in your mind. You can walk around the table, get what you need out of it. Please do a tutorial on <laughs> cheeks. Cats talking shit again. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, I see. No, she's not she's a good girl. Can you summarize when you use a soft brush for your shadow? Um, summarize it. I don't know how to teach without demonstrating. Um, but summarizing it, basically, what I did today with the cast shot, with the soft brush, is I captured the nature of the cast shadow. The cast shadow is best for explaining to the audience that, hey, this area is softer because the light source is far away. So in this case, the soft brush was needed to exemplify that distance and that fuzzing out of the cast shadow, this beautiful thing. You want to know what is the most gorgeous thing about this entire painting? It isn't the eyes, it isn't the hair detail, oh, everybody goes for this, everybody goes for the ear, everybody goes for the eye, it's this, this little triangle. This is where it's at, it's this right here, this edge work, it's this cast shadow, it's, the, it's this cast shadow as well. This one just gives me the heebie-jeebies so beautiful this cash shadow you see it's showing the nature of the lip all right that's what's important it's this one right here and this bounce light all of this is done with a soft brush because it's a very soft and he's a very beautiful man as well so you got that going for you and, and you have that dressing up with this sh with the with the with the shadow nature you have like a, a successful piece and just look at the eye do you see any outlining you literally have shade one crease shadow, shade two, eyelash shadow, he doesn't even have dark eyelashes on. You can't paint everybody with super mascara and eyeliner, can you? So you have to just start going in there and choosing the exact value you're seeing and most of the time you're going to need an edge. You can't just go in there and draw a line for the eyes. Barely, barely any crease for the lower eyelid. There's nothing happening in the eye to show the eye. And if you can pull off the believability with as little rendering as it really is in the photograph, that's what makes you a professional. It's when you start giving in to your desire to outline the eye. That's when we have fake form, artificial form. For this piece, what I wanted to cover, I don't think I have time. Um, the nose is just a little bit small and just a little bit unusual. Outside of her age as well, the nose is kind of over outlined. 
just like that. It's a little tiny nose. And I'm just enlarging it just because of her age to keep her age consistent. Okay, diagnostically, um, I'm not going to be the audience to your creativity right now. I'm just going to be teacher mode. I'm always teacher mode. And I'm never an audience to your creativity. I think that's what, that's a problem that some people have with me. They see me no, not giving out compliments as an audience of creativity would. Ooh, I love the color choice. Ooh, I, I really love the accent of this detail. I don't talk like that. That's why people have like a problem with the way I teach. I'm always in teacher mode. I'm looking at it as a teacher filter. Um, so if we were to get rid of all this color and just get into your basic skill, just to measure your skill where you are right now, you're probably on day two of a 14-day challenge or day one. Um, so your the anatomy around the eye is very undefined, very dependent on this very rough rendition. You do have an extreme edge line here, which means that, yes, even if you were to fully render an eye, you would depend on this extreme line. Luckily, this character is wearing makeup. Luckily, she is a female, and we do bring in an outline makeup around her eyes, so you get away with it there. Um, but uh, we have no in the indications of shadow. We have no cast shadows seen. Maybe your reference did have cast shadow. You didn't see them. So this is a day two of a 14-day challenge, and it's being used in a masterpiece to stage some creativity with your color choice and stuff. You use a white background here. So in teacher mode, I don't approve of any of this. Hair, texture studies for hair, lots of problems with rendering hair, should be taken in a separate stage. If you want to do a 14-day challenge with hair attached, that's fine. Just make sure it doesn't obstruct the face so you can just assess the symmetry required in rendering stamina required just to cover the face. You can deal with that separately and not have to hide it. Um, symmetry is great. Beauty is great. I think you captured the downward tilt of the beautiful eye very well. You do have a, uh, a you did have a small nose, um, but after fixing all of this and focusing your study on just one uh, group at a time instead of trying to do it all at the same time, color, form, beauty, and hair, and accessories, and all of that, I think you'll find that you improve much faster. The next time you attempt this in six months, attempt this again. Try to paint this again in six months. You'll see that your the new version that you did is a lot more, uh, it's a lot more skill. Okay, so grayscale, just grayscaling helps me see form better, just as a teacher mode. Um, but yeah, I'm never like a, <laughs> I don't do that unless I'm browsing on Instagram. That's when I become an audience of creativity. I'm just like browsing around Instagram. Um, but yeah, other than that, I don't really compliment, and that's what that's what people have a problem with. All right, so this fella right here, really good job, good job on rendering, uh, but you have an issue with anatomy. Um, the forehead sticks out further than the chin. And what you did was the exact opposite, which was on the, on the skeletal level, non-human. And that's when anatomy comes in. That's when the critique comes in. When you do something that is so outside of the norm that it's a whole new anatomy, that on the skeletal level it is new and unusual and alien, um, yes, then, then, then the critique is valid in saying that this is wrong, this is actually not how to do it. There's no creative um, uh, validity behind this kind of choice, unless you really were deliberately going and designing a whole new anatomy in your interpretation of human faces. If the character in their new anatomy that looks like this was deliberately designed this way, then that's a rule deliberately broken. But if this is accidental, and that's where I come in and that's where the, the issue comes in, if this was an accidental disproportionate face, you have a lot of work ahead of you to really get a whole better hold of your, of your uh, just anatomy knowledge. For the lips and the chin, it's like a stairwell. You got stair number one, stair number two, number three, number four, one. It just keeps going down at, right out of the nose. That's a good kind of little tip to remember. The chin, the forehead, all of that just moves straight back down. Okay, so you had some really, really big issues here. You were zoomed up a little bit too much. Um, you are, your values are good. You're rendering around everything a little bit. You know, there is some radial shading just around the cheek. I feel like there is a little bit too much um, outlining around the eyes. But we all start somewhere, and this is just a great great indicator for you on where to start and what's left ahead of you. <clears throat> the face is very unusual, very unique as well, which is really cool. This is a little bit high. And then um, 
I would just, just to hurry it along, I would just erase this. And show you where the jaw does start. Just to outline it for you. Now he looks like Liam Neeson. A little bit more concrete anatomy. Concrete definition around that. So again, you just have to ask yourself, I can't reach into your brains, I wish I could. <laughs> um, I can't reach into your brains and find out how what your table looks like right now. So you gotta spend some time ruminating, ask yourself, how am I interpreting all of this? What does my table look like? And the last time I imagined an eye, what did it look like? Was it a sculpture? And don't force it and don't lie to yourselves. Was it a sculpture or was it a flat image? At that point, it really helps you figure out how to study. Finding out what your table looks like means whether like it's whether or not you're going to be a year from now before you get better or six months from now. Shaving six months off any term is great. <laughs> it's wonderful. Go for it. Anything, anything that will speed up the process, right? But speed up the process efficiently, not artificial kind of like garbo um, filters that make your paintings look better. We're talking about real improvement, real form. I'm not sure what other changes to make but these are some of the just the some of the tips and tricks I have on figuring out where you currently are with your visual library your visual library your brain is always out to sabotage you make sure you have control of it and control of the way it stores information okay so I'll show you the before and after I did give out a lot of brushes in the last two weeks um, I think I'm just reached my quota but honestly, if I find some great reference, uh, like great notes written down, all everyone benefits from these notes. I'll still give out some brushes. I don't really mind. <clears throat> okay, so but for those who are new, have no idea what I'm talking about. Good note takers who post their notes on the community get brushes. They get stuff. They get free stuff. <laughs> Um, I mean, it's not much. It's just the my brushes. It's not a big reward or some kind of optimal. Um, I don't know, C, Terry, I don't always get a C in the board or anything like that, but it is just a, you know, a little token of my appreciation. Um, thank you everyone for coming. I will see you guys on Tuesday the 18th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Have a great day, guys. Bye-bye.